All right, you guys, so I made it to Martin's workshop. Uh, Martin does uh, parts, he does automotive repair, uh, machine work, aerospace. So anyways, um, we're here. Martin's nice to see you. How you doing? So if you wanna show us around your workshop and uh, see what you got working on. So I do stuff from vintage antique engines. This is a 49 Oldsmobile Rocket, board 180 over for a customer. It was in a hot rod in, uh, in the 50s. Okay, right on. This is the crankshaft grinder. We grind crankshafts. I think uh, the beast. <laughs> OD grinding, you know, up to about 74 inches in, di in the length and about, it'll do about six or seven inches in diameter and it'll grind tapered shafts. Nice, okay, cool. It has a 22 inch grinding wheel. How long have you had the crank grinder for? I've had that probably about four years. Okay. Five years. How much does it weigh? I think it weighs about 7,500 pounds. My, that seems massive. It really is. All right, let's see what else we got. Um, this is a small boring bar we use to bore cylinders on the block. It's old, probably from the 30s or 40s. It's a Van Norman. Uh, it's been running uh, flawlessly. It looks bad, but it does accurate all as straight as can be. Nice. You said from the 40s? Yeah. Very cool. Here's an old index mill that originally came from Lockheed. This one's probably about 1955 or 54. You put a DRO on it? Yeah, I put a DRO on there, mm -hmm. you know, make things easier for the guys. So for this one here, what do you what do you mainly use this one for? I do I mainly use this for doing hole pattern work and indexing work using the DRO. Okay. For the positioning. Right. Simplicity of it. And uh, what, what year is this one from, do you think you said? 54, I believe. 54. It's got all the tags and everything on the side where it was sold at. We just found out about seven or eight machines in Martin's shop all came from Los Angeles at different sellers. So kind of a cool history as to all the different things that were going on down in LA. So, and then uh, tell me more about this one right here. This is called a Blockmaster. It's made by Storm Vulcan out of Dallas and it's mostly used to surface uh, cylinder blocks and cylinder heads. Okay, like this one that, this one you just finished doing? Right. Look at that finish on And it puts on that classic texture for the early style uh, composition head gaskets. Yeah, it looks really sharp. What type of uh, cylinder head is this? That's a 60 Ford 223. Okay. Very cool. And you got all the different, you know how many cutters are on here? 20 or so? Yeah, there's like 20 cutters on yeah. there. And they have to be indexed, you know. Yeah, could you guys imagine indexing each cutter on each one? So that's a, that's a challenge in itself there. All right. And we got the old Logan right in the middle. I used to have an old Logan lathe, very similar to this one. So this one brings back a lot of memories. Yep. Old Reliable. And this one is a Logan 920. Yep, from 1951. 1951. All right, and then this one right here is the newest, the newest one to the family. Yeah, it's uh, late 50s to late 60s. Closing Paul Chester 13 by 36. So this machine here probably made a lot of the parts on the British bike. This one's made in this one's made in England, right? Yeah. Or yeah, made in England here. So this is a really beautiful machine. We just got this one last weekend. Yeah, we've already started running it. Putting it to work. And then we have this massive um, horizontal this a, mill. This is an RX horizontal mill from Italy. It's about late 50s. Late 50s? It does, I do all the gear cutting and axle splaying on this machine and all the complex indexing and mm -hmm. spiral gears and helical gears. Nice, okay. Because it will, it will cut helix gears and stuff. Wow. It's, it's, big it's a table. universal, so it's not really a, a plain horizontal because the table does pivot. Okay, it pivots. And you were saying that this one, you have the a detachable head, so you can make it a vertical mill? Right. This one? You have that attachment? Yes. Oh, okay. See it down there? Uh, oh, there it is right there. So that's pretty handy. So you can have a horizontal mill and a vertical mill. So yeah, and you need that head to do certain gear profiles. You got box ways on it. Man, that's pretty cool. Moving on over. And here's a Cincinnati Toolmaster. That's, I'd say it's from the '60s, maybe the later part of the '60s that mm -hmm. we picked up. Uh, I guess a month or two ago. Okay. It cleaned up pretty nice. It doesn't seem to be that bad shape, except for the. The feed box has some stripped out gears, which we will make, and we'll make some videos about that. Very cool. 
He's got this really cute rotary thing right here. Yes, that's <laughs> a really awesome. cool Ellis. And it has a genuine six job buck check on it. Are these uh, independent or they're scroll? The scroll. Okay. That's very cool. And it's got on, um, it came with the dividing plates and everything. Very cool. All right. Yeah. And this was my first milling machine, which is a 57 index, just like the, the first mill we looked at. But it's the more stripped down version. It doesn't have any power at feed. It doesn't have any linear scales or anything on it. Mm -hmm. You can still see the scrapes and everything on here. Little scrape down. So you've had this one for what, 15, 20 years? Yeah, I got in in the early 2000s. Oh, wow. That's very really cool. It's a sharp machine. And as you guys can see, all these machines are put to work, so they're not display. Um, they're workhorses, which they're intended to be. This is a LeBlanc 15 inch. Um, I don't know by 72 or something like that it's from about 1941 okay so uh, during the war yeah wow and this thing again like in the video it's really hard for you guys to see but I mean this thing is just solid casting um, I mean it's just a these are really rigid machines and it's cool because you know these machines really you know they contribute either to a war effort or you know they help build America so it's cool that these machines are are in action making making parts and Keeping other things on the road. And this one you picked up with this mill? Right, so I okay. got this mill and about a thousand pounds worth of tooling and a cold saw that day. <laughs> so and, awesome. and a bunch of bending equipment. Mm -hmm. And this one is another mill that has nice big dials on it. You know, that's what's attractive about a lot of these, uh, I mean, lathes. Right, know? absolutely. Yeah, a lot of them. Like, yeah, like my, my new lathe, it just, you know, everything's all etched in. It's just not the same quality as you would yeah, find. Yeah, see, they started doing more like that when they. See, it has the more frosted, look, the powdered look. Yes, exactly. Again, box weighs, really rigid machine. Yeah, and it takes a collet, call the C. And this is a uh, the same collet used in the Cincinnati tool grinders. Okay. So if you have one of these machines and you can't find collets, look up the collets, this the C model collet for the Cincinnati tool grinders. Okay, C model collet. Yeah, there's different sizes like C and B. And, and this this is, um, what was this that you explained it's to me? It's a earlier? pneumatic collet check for the 5C collet. Okay. And it's, uh, I've never used it. I guess they were running production on here before. It had a, had had a turret on it and everything. Mm -hmm. So this machine was put to work, uh, you know, religiously at some point. <laughs> And this is just a calculator. Everybody thinks that this is a, a, a variable speed. A variable speed, but it's a calculator. You know, Check you t out. tell it the diameter of the work and the material, and it'll tell you what feeds and speeds to run it on. Huh? That is very cool. You got the uh, some type of BSA fork assembly there. Yeah, that's a BSA, probably like a B33 or whatever smaller than the A10. Mm-hmm. The little uh, singles. I got that with some 12. stuff that uh, you know wasn't right. You know. And uh, of course, I got the home. Got the Sun and Honey machine. This is the same one as mine, the MBB 1600. This is the last year of the cast iron base. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty rigid machines. And that's the uh, Van Norman IDL seat and guide machine for cutting valve guides and seats and any kind of head, cylinder heads, you know? Right, absolutely. Um, Looks like you got some work on there too. Yep, yeah, so Very yeah, cool. we're doing these heads here. and. You know, these are 4.3 Chevy race cylinder heads, Brodix Jr. heads, so. Mm -hmm. It's doing a valve seat replacement on it? We're doing the full guides and seats and everything. Very cool, looking good. It's the old South Band, I think it's from about 69, 59 or 69, I don't remember. It's a 13 by 36, and This a 13 been... by 42, I think. 13 by 42? Yeah, and this 13 one... by six feet. Yeah. It, what's the um oh it's got through spindle um martin was saying that this one is actually the quietest one that he has because um it's got uh yeah it's the, got the no big, bearings yeah no getting so the spindle runs in the uh, casting it's got so it's basically plain bearing like a crankshaft on a car okay so it's got no bearing noise it's got no gears except for the feed you know so mm -hmm. it's, it, it runs off the flat belt from a pulley down below okay so it's quiet and it leaves a nice finish because it doesn't t pick up any harmonics from the bearings. From the bearings. So it's interesting because when I was uh, talking with Martin earlier on the Logan lathe, how it has bearings as opposed to, 
you know, driving directly in the casting. So most guys think that bearings are better, it's easier. And I'm sure that something like this, how he was saying the finish is better, but then you got to shim it and things of that sort. But I guess uh, longevity wise and better finish, um, he's saying that this one is definitely, definitely the way to go. And he definitely puts this one to work too. You got the uh, taper attachment on it. That's original to the machine. Yep. Can you fire this one up for us? Yep. Okay. Turn it up. You can't even hear it. Other than the bell, I mean, that's silky smooth and quiet. And this is a South Bend, what is the model again? It's a 13 by 42. Okay. Are these called like a heavy 13 or? No. That so that 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 term heavy came into play when the 10 inch machine. When you get up to the 10 inch machine, they had a 10L and a 10K. Okay. And one was heavier than the other one. That's uh, the heavy 10 was built like these the bigger models. Mm -hmm. but it was. And I most of your machines are all 220. Yeah, most yeah. of them are all 223 paying. All right, All right. and this cool. one over here is a Quickway OD grinder. This is from the, you said 30s and 40s in that yeah, area? Yeah, I guess, I guess probably 1940, early 40s maybe. Yeah, and so you can do reamers, cutters. What do you primarily use this machine for? Reamers, Yeah. making custom sized reamers for doing valve work. Okay. For doing, you know, uh, valve guide work mostly. Mm -hmm. And sharpening, uh, uh, side mills and stuff for milling machines got it okay you know and we index it like this so we'd put the relief on the uh stop here is uh, exactly opposite of the tooth to be cut mm -hmm. and so on very cool and this is uh what, what is this tool called that's called a planer gauge planer gauge very cool piece yeah these are really hard to find um, I think I've seen one other for sale, but it's they're not very common. You were talking about the travel. Can you show us the travel on this machine? You guys can get a picture of that. <laughs> and this base is solid cast iron. And um, Martin was telling me earlier that the Quickway base, they're somewhat universal with other Quickway well, type of machines. So I've seen early Quickway automotive valve grinders that use the same base. Okay. And actually, I saw one recently, and I got excited when I looked up, and it was just a valve grinder. <laughs> thought it was one of the. Yeah, OD I, thought, grinders. I thought it was another one of these grinders. This thing will will turn the work. You know, you can power turn the work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I just you know I do mostly like small custom stuff. Right. It will also. Um, Oh, you could put a chuck on here and you don't have to hold it between centers. Okay, so there's different know. ways of holding the um, right. white piece. Right, and you could do taper cuts on here. You could you just set the, the tail stock accordingly. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, everything works pretty nice and quick on here, you know? Very cool. And that's a piece for the horizontal mill? Right, so there's the cutter for the horizontal mill. And this in the center here is just the grinding arbor. So these are just spacers to take up the space between the nut. Right, okay. And so essentially the, like for example, reamers, like if a customer brought you, let's say a, a nominal size three quarter reamer, they want a couple thousandths ground off. As long as it has centers, Martin can grind the OD to be able to accommodate whatever hole that you want to ream. So this tool makes it really handy. So, you know, a lot of companies out there that make, you know, very special reamers that are a few thousandths undersized, they charge you a lot of money for it. And uh, it's a lot cheaper to find nominal sizes. So this machine will, uh, will handle that and has the capabilities to do so. So that's a great that's a great machine. And what what RPM is that? Well, that's the bar is running a typical seventeen fifty, and the and the fiddle's probably going about five thousand maybe. Wow! Because you see the difference in the fluid size. Oh, okay. Like thirty five hundred something like that. It does have automatic feed though. I'm gonna take it apart and fix it from the end of that one. But it does have automatic longitudinal feed. Very cool. And here's the, lever, the trip lever for that. And you can also run coolant on here, I'd imagine? Yeah. Yeah. So it does have the tray in the back. Coolant tank in the back. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you for showing us this one.
And this one right here is a surface grinder. This is probably the biggest surface grinder that I've ever seen. What's the, uh, the year on it, Martin? This one's about 1941. 1941. And it was owned by the Air Force. Check that out. What size is that, that chuck? Jeez. That chuck is like uh, 10 by 20. Man. The wheel uses 12 inch diameter grinding wheels. 12 inch diameter, look at that. Nice smooth operation. A nice giant hand wheel. This is an abrasive brand? Yep. Are they still in uh, business today? Silky quiet. Wow. It'll move in tents. You got tents on there? Yeah. How big the dial is, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. And this thing is, you might not be able to see it in the, in the video, but this thing is, it's, this is a really big surface grinder. I've had Martin grind parts for me on this surface grinder, and the finish on it is beautiful. And this is a really solid machine. And it's a cool piece of, uh, cool piece of history with it being 1941 and World War II and the, the whole war effort, so very cool. You guys know uh, now that Martin does a lot of automotive work, so this is some of the machine work that he's done. This is for a customer's uh, block. Can you tell me more about this block? This is a 223 Ford, off the same motor from that cylinder head we saw earlier. Earlier, next to the, the Vulcan. Next to the Blockmaster. Blockmaster. On the Blockmaster. On yeah. the Blockmaster, okay. So, so yeah, so. Thing. And so this one, um, you this did a lot of work to it. Yeah, it was in bad shape. It was already 60 over and it was, uh, the guy didn't want to go anymore. And he asked me to sleeve it back to standard bore, so I did. So right now it's sleeved back to standard bore and it's been decked. So it's got six sleeves in it. Did you have to, um, this is straight from the boring bar? It's straight off the boring Look bar. Look at that finish. That's, and that's, that's what I was talking thing. to you about, those brace carbide inserts that come with the machines. Right. They leave the best finish better than those carbide index finish. That is amazing. Yes. That is a really, really solid finish. I mean, that's just, wow, it's amazing. Van Norman claims you can, you don't have to hone. Wow, that's really something. Nice finish on it. Uh, you said all six of them had sleeves? Yeah, they do now. Okay, so you can barely see. Barely, barely see. Nice chamfer on the top. This is really solid. I don't like to put too big of a chamfer because I think it's just, all it does is aid into the blowing of head gaskets because it's pushing, uh, it's giving you less material there, plus it's aiding the uh, pressure that way, you know? Got it, okay. Plus any material you, lose, you move, remove always lowers compression too. That's really solid. All right, so you're working on this one. What other, um, other projects are you working on that you're willing to share with us? Well, we're making some parts for you. Making some parts for CBS? The yeah. proprietary camshaft bushing pilots that you guys have purchased, which I appreciate. Martin's making up the mandrels. There we go. And that's a 12L14 uh, material that we're using there. And he's doing it on the old Clausing Colchester lathe. So he's uh, using a British lathe to make British parts. So I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> that looks pretty good, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's appropriate. So right here, we do a lot of machinery repair also, so people will bring parts. This is the parts from that came to me from a, a quill handle off of a milling machine, you know? Wow. And then uh, we made another one. Look at that. And you did that on the horizontal, on this machine here? Yeah. So we indexed it in here. And then we used a cutter there. We had to make that, that mandrel real quick because we didn't have a small enough one to put in this machine, really. Mm -hmm. Actually, I just bought one, but it came in after I made the part. You know? <laughs> Always works out that way. Yeah, but now I have it, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Next job, you'll be prepared. This is a Hartford indexer. They're pretty popular. You put a masking plate in the back of it so you can, it's uh, foolproof. You'll never land in a spot you don't need if you put one according to how many indexes your part needs. Got it, okay. So there's no dividing or anything like that. It's real quick. Absolutely. And so that rotary table, you can do it. You can use it vertically, horizontal, right? Pretty universal. Then you have the tail stock right here to hold the opposite yep. end of the. This part. Tail, this tail stock here is uh, is extremely universal, as you can see. It's got movement here. You can move the angle, and uh, and then you can move it up and down at its angle, and it's clearanced on the top for the cutter to go over across the top. So this is one of the workhorses that you that you use quite a bit. 
Yeah, that's very cool. This machine runs a few times a month at the minimum, mm -hmm. and it usually does a lot of heavy spline cutting and stuff like that. Very cool. All right. We came back to the cylinder head here. As you guys know, earlier Martin went ahead and surfaced uh, the head gasket, but he's gonna talk, uh, talk to us a little bit more about these inserts that he's put inside the valve guide. So can you tell me a little bit more about that, Martin? So about this, this head, the customer brought it and he just wanted to do a simple valve job, but I wouldn't let him do that because I wanted it to be nice. The valve, the valve guides were worn out and they're integral castings with, with the head. So we reamed them out and we put what's called K liners in there and it's a bronze thin wall liner. And then we sized them back to size, which is 11 30 seconds in this case and basically tighten that all up so it's you know a lot better than it was absolutely you get a lot more life and it won't burn any oil through there now you're saying that the the valve guide is integral to the head so it's all casted together so instead of doing the liner what would be the alternative uh you know to that well you could bore it out another uh eighth inch or so and put a thick wall valve guide in there okay and and you i would imagine want to recommend that just because the material you're hogging out so it's a lot of, and I'm sure it's probably more accurate just to follow the existing hole right. and then just put in a liner. Yeah, so I would say why remove the material if you don't have to? It's like doing a cylinder. Why would you go 60 over if you only have to go 40 over? Right, absolutely. That sort of thing, you know. And plus, you know, it's it's an old 60 Ford work truck, you know, mm -hmm. and it's it's not a hot rod. It just, it just wants to be reliable. Right, absolutely. So when the now when these liners wear out, you can just press them out, put new ones in? Yep. Wow, just like that. So it's a lot easier. So like, you know, British bikes, you have valve guides, you got to move the valve guide. Then when you move the guide, you could, you know, mess up the hole, the bore. This way, you just punch out the uh, liner and you just press a new one in and then touch up the seats and you're good to go. Yep. And since they're thin wall, they don't, they, they're easy to get out. Easy to get out. They don't collapse the way you want them to to take them out. Absolutely. Very, very cool. Let's check out the other side of the cylinder head so I can get a, get a view. So that's what they look like here. As you can see, it looks like a valve guide, but it's all integral. I got the uh, inserts in place. Is there any more work you have to do to the cylinder head or, the, or it's ready for the customer? Um, it's pretty much ready. We're gonna clean it up a little more and that's it. We did the valve job. We machined the seats, we machined the valves. All, we, all we're gonna do now is, is trim the little excess pieces of the liner. Got it. And, uh, and then all I'm gonna do is, he's gonna put a little bit of a cam in it, mm -hmm. and I'm just gonna make sure that, that there ain't there gonna be any coil bind issues, that's all. Right, that absolutely. shouldn't be. Absolutely, cool. All right, well, thank you for sharing that one with us. You got it. So we are in Martin's house, and Martin, tell me a little bit more about this machine, then we're gonna go into what we have, or what he's checking here. This is an old sure to make a optical grinder, I mean, optical comparator. Okay. And we came from JPL over there, and uh, you know a lot of these old old tools from companies are you know, really useful for small shops. Right, absolutely. So anyway, so what, what you do here is you really want to inspect something down to the tenths or you know microns or whatever. Okay. And you'd put it up here, and then it project it projects a light onto the part, and then it goes through some lenses where it, where it multiplies it and then off a mirror in the bottom and, and projects it onto this screen right here okay where it's bigger and then you can measure it using the the micrometer dials here got it so you got an x and y in here and then you have a uh, you have this to 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 line up your uh, your x and y axis perfect and then so for a trained eye if you guys notice that uh, this lifter here is for um, one of the race bikes that I own, but you guys know that I do uh, cam fall or regrinding. So I have a new fixture to do a three inch radius. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm having Martin check to make sure that the surface area here, the face uh, where it would be on the cam lobe uh, is parallel. And so this one here that he's checking is, is no good, um, which is fine because I know the mistake that I made. So I have another one here that he's gonna check. So uh, can you explain to them what you currently see on the the face or where the you know where it would meet up with the camshaft loop so basically it's like checking something with a square but more accurate and you would line up the side and then you would look at your other angle and you would see if it was perpendicular so you could see when you you move the micrometer and you zero the end of the part here you can see light between the axis here got it and so that is 
that's due to the fixture that I was using, um, you know, telling Martin off camera, and I don't want to get too deep involved, but um, centering on the fixture rather than on the, the, the center of the spindle and the spin index. Uh, so basically, essentially, the radius is off, and more than likely, the hole probably wasn't square or where it should have been. So we get a little bit of light down here at the bottom. So there's a lifter right there, and then this is a micrometer that Martin just explained. And uh, so this is the no good lifter. I can put it back in the fixture and regrind it. Um, now, as far as this graph, is this called a graph? Uh, what, what is the name of this this disc here? I see that there's different numbers on it. There's two thousandths, four thousandths. So this is an over an overlay uh, template that you would. It just has more lines on it, so you can you know you can check different you know more complex geometry. Okay. And the lines, uh, you know, this is a twenty times equals two thousandths and stuff like that. Got it. Very so cool. It's all for measurement, you know doing precise stuff okay yeah this is uh, perfect so what i'll do off camera we'll swap out the other the other lifter that i feel um or known that is you know that's a good lifter or at least the face so we'll compare the two and see how we did all right so we went ahead and swapped out lifters and we're going to check and see what we get just doing some adjustments here So obviously the goal is zero in a perfect world. Uh, lifters do break in. Um, so something like this, when the scale is blown up in your face, sometimes things can be a little bit more or seem to be worse than they really are considering you know what it's for. Um, so we'll take a look and see what we've gotten so far on this one. This one's a lot nicer than the other one. As you can see, the the line of light between the the line on the comparator and the part is a lot straighter than the other one. Good. Okay. And then what you do is you set it on zero here on the micrometer and then turn it so the light goes away on the other end. And that's how you would measure it if it was off. Got it. And, and I'm sure the some guys would probably say, well, you know, you could put the lifter in your cylinder barrel. And I've had conversations about this with Martin before. Um, sometimes cylinder barrels could be crooked if the bottom or the base have been milled. Um, you know, the cam bores. I mean, there's so many different things that could make, um, you know, something that seems perfect not. Um, but in, in a case like this, from based off what we see here, it looks like this lifter is is good to go. So the main goal is to try to get it as square and as straight as we possibly can. So when a customer puts a lifter in the cylinder barrel, everything will be, um, it'll be parallel to the cam lobe. So, uh, I'm sorry, what was the name of this machine again? It's an optical comparator. Optical comparator. And and what do you typically use it for on your, you know, day-to-day -day job? What do you like I to use, use it for? I use this for uh, when I'm when I'm grinding tools, I'm checking tool profiles, okay. gear profiles and stuff like that. Got it. And so you can do threads, you can check threads right. and got it different angles i can check the threads i can measure the thread pitch on tiny screws sometimes i make screws smaller than eyeglass screws you know wow like watchmaker that's very yeah. cool all right well that's it guys um so martin i appreciate you checking this for me it's really important that you know customers um you know see the process that goes in but it's also great to have someone explain how the machine works so thank you for that thanks all right so what do we have in here martin so we got a few small machines in here we got the uh a little diamond horizontal mill that was outside. This machine was made in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. This is a 1946 machine. 1946. Kind of reminds me of the old uh, Benchmaster that I used to have, probably around the same size. Very convenient. So this is a horizontal mill. And so you can um, you could still do the same thing as a large horizontal. Uh, right. Gears. It's just a small scale. Yeah. So I've done gears on here. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of hole drilling on here. I've made a lot of a lot of parts for the Air Force on here. And this one, um, so some of the cool features is uh, power feed, right? Right. Yeah, it's got a the linkage that would be on that right. side for the power feed. So there's a link piece that goes in here that we're remaking the feed. There's a little box here. Mm -hmm. You can join them together, and then you have power feed. That's just on one axis. Right. Got it. Just on the X axis. Very cool. This is three phase. This is single phase. Oh, single phase. So that's convenient. And that's why I put them in this building because it's only single phase. Only single phase. 
Now this one here, I was really surprised at how much this one weighs. And I'm sure most of you guys probably don't know what this is. What is this, Martin? It's a two-dimensional pantograph. Two-dimensional pantograph. And how much does it weigh? This thing weighs at least 1,500 pounds. 1,500 pounds. Look at that. That is really something. 1,500 pounds. So, um, yeah, can you walk us through how it works? So yeah. what you do is you put your, they call these copies, what they are, they're patterns of whatever you want to engrave. This machine does engraving. Okay. And you drop the stylus in the groove. Mm -hmm. You follow it there. And then down here where the work goes, you it, it reduces it by the amount that you set on the scale bars. Okay. And you're able to just basically trace the part and then you can figure out how big you want to make the image or whatever right. you're tracing to it. Right, so you can make the part about 40 times smaller than the pattern. <laughs> 40 times and and this one what type of work do you i know you're doing on i seen on instagram you do a lot of custom uh, you know shift knobs is what other type of things can you do on here we engrave some firearm stuff on here and names we do uh trophy type stuff and plaques and you know like brass tags and stuff like that and uh you know stuff like people make stuff for people's birthdays right and stuff and gifts and everything okay Sometimes people will want a design and I'll send them to my friend and she will make the design and mm -hmm. send it back to me from the East Coast. And she'll etch it out of our laser machine and we'll put it in here. Wow. So we can go right off a picture to the laser machine mm -hmm. to, to the pattern and then put it on whatever you want. Right. Absolutely. That is awesome. And so last but not least, we have, which recently has been my favorite is the uh, valve grinder machine this thing is really really solid this is a sioux valve grinder yeah sioux 645 sioux 645 and what can you tell me about this one here well it's a it's a nice valve grinder for, very nice for uh automotive and mm -hmm. motorcycle stuff it's a nice size it uses a smaller size grinding wheels as opposed to the other machine wow the uh this is very interesting about the uh, check there the check stops you know, so you can load it. And also, it will stop if you do that. So, this, 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 the truck will stay open, which is cool. Uh -huh. There's your dead stop for the back of your valve, which has a cone shape on the outside. Right. And here's your diamond dresser, which you swing over here to dress the wheel with. Go back and forth. And, and this, now the Sioux Grinder, I don't know if it's proprietary to them, but um, tell me more about the the three bearings in the chuck yeah so this thing has uh they're they're sort of like ball bearings but they're little tapered cones in there and they seem to be the most accurate and because they only touch on one part of the radius okay and then the other the 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 stop here that has the cone centered it is what will stabilize the rear and keep the valve straight got it so instead of grabbing on a small portion of a shank of a valve, especially when it's been worn out, right. you'll grab up here by three points and then all the way on the tip of the valve. So you have more, you know, it'll be straighter that way. Right. And like you explained to me before when I was using the valve grinder, because I have a valve grinder machine too, but I have, I think it's like ER collets, but it's only grabbing on one point of the valve. So on this one, it's grabbing on basically, essentially two points. You're grabbing at the front and then you're also locating at the back with a tapered cone. So it just makes this one a little bit far more superior uh, versus some of the other grinders out there. And um, I mean, it, you, you definitely notice that when you're working with something that has a lot of run out, you know, this type of setup will prevent that um, or extremely small amount. Um, this machine, this is the original paint on here? I believe so. This machine is all original. The cabinet's been painted, you know, somebody painted over the, the, the sun and logo there, you know. This uh, original cabinet or this for something different? No, it's a sun and cabinet. Oh, okay. See it. A bunch of valve stuff is in there, and grinders, and uh, dressers, and all kinds of stuff. Very cool. A lot of pieces in there. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff in here. I mean, here's those little cones. Uh, oh, wow. For the jaws, that's what they look like. Interesting. I always thought they were bearings. Okay. And they're extremely precision, you know. And they're replaceable. Right. Cool. They're a little expensive. Now, for th make them, but. this type of chuck, like my ER collet, I have to, you know, get different collets for different diameters. This one can accept pretty much any diameter valve. Right. It'll go from 
smaller than quarter inch all the way up to like half inch or nine sixteenths. So you can do small applications and you can go all the way up to automotive or all kinds of different things here. Yeah, you can do big truck stuff on here to mm -hmm. a certain extent, you know. Right, absolutely. And then on the other side, you have a fixture to be able to do the tips of the valves. Yeah, so you tip the valves here, you clamp it down in there, and then tip it on that grinding wheel there. Do if it passes on it, and you got the knob there to feed it in. Yeah, and then you got here where you can put a diamond dresser or whatever, the other attachment for the rockers. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, oh, rockers for automotive. Right. Okay. And then you got the coolant here, and I got the entire system. Yeah, and then you got the coolant. So you don't burn up your valves and you leave a nice finish, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Because the valve, it's easy to screw up a valve, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. The heat that's generated, that coolant makes it makes all the difference in the world. Right, and once you get the valve high, it doesn't want to grind properly, you know? Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, and we got all the. Uh, Pilots for like flathead Fords and all that kind of stuff, you know. Because yeah. that's about, you know, that's how big the valve guides are on a flathead Ford. Wow, amazing. So you're pretty much all pulled up. And then we used to grind the seats, but now we use the cutters, you know. Got it. Upgraded to the cutters? Yeah, it's just less dust. You gotta breathe in all day, you know? Right, absolutely. And I know that I said that this was the last thing I wanted to show you guys, but I remember when I was here before, Martin was showing me something very interesting here. This piece here, um, it caught my eye. Can you tell me a little bit more about this one, Martin? That is a homemade rod straightening or checking device fixture. So it's homemade, but look how nice it is. I mean, look at the welding and everything on it. I mean, this thing's really solid. And what type of, um, what type of rod? This rod happens to be, I think, a Model T rod. A Model T. And I got this from a fella that used to Fully redo Model A's and Model T engines. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And you had another one, I believe, yeah. or something similar to it? So in here, there's another one there. You see it? Oh, wow. And that one, you know, you have all the different mandrels for the different undersized. Uh, for the big ends? Yeah, because all these Model T and Model A rods are babbitted, so. <laughs> I just want to say uh, thank you for watching and thank you for Martin for your hospitality and showing us around the machine shop. Is there anything that you want to say? How can people find you? You can find me on the internet at the, on the vintagemachinist.com. Okay. You can find me on Instagram that's under the same title. Okay. Or Facebook. Got it. And we'll put his links in the description at the bottom. Do you have a YouTube or anything? Um, I do and it's uh, the same name. The same name. So on Instagram, the content that you do is he's uploading videos about work, um, parts that you're making. Um, so that's would, would that be a better place for people to follow you is on Instagram to see what you got going on here in the shop? Yes, that would be the best way. Best way. Perfect. Okie dokie. All right. Well, again, Martin, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for coming by. Absolutely. Thank you.